Now that we've learned a bit about the structures of eukaryotic cells, let's talk about how they communicate with their adjacent and distant cellular neighbors. So let's talk a bit about cells and their borders. Now cells in a multicellular organism, they need to coordinate their activities. in order for the cells to function properly and in order for that organism to be able to do all of the activities it needs to do. Adjacent neighboring cells, they can communicate via direct connections. Whereas distant cells communicate via chemicals and we call these communication chemicals hormones. So we'll talk about these two situations, communication between direct neighbors and communication between distant cells. The connection point between two neighboring cells we call cell junctions. Cell junctions provide a variety of different functions. One, they provide structural stability to the cellular community. For example, a tissue or an organ is made up of a bunch of these cells directly connected to each other. They can also allow neighboring cells to communicate. In fact, some of these junctions can allow cells to pass substances from one cell to another. Directly outside of these cells is something known as the extracellular matrix. The prefix extra just means outside of cell referring to cell and matrix being just a collection of proteins. So in tissues, the material outside of the cells, again, is known as the extracellular matrix. The extracellular matrix helps to hold tissues together. This matrix is usually composed of a fibrous protein network. When we look at the actual connection points between animal cells, it turns out that there are three types of direct connections that animal cells have. The first of these are known as tight junctions. Now, tight junctions make a waterproof connection between two cells. And by waterproof, what I mean is that water won't be able to pass from one side of the tissue to the others. Epithelial tissue, which makes up the surface of our skin, is often connected by tight junctions. The next type of junction are the anchoring junctions. Now, the anchoring junctions are the junctions with the greatest strength. These are how muscle cells will be connected to each other. And in fact, there will be visible rivets or anchoring points known as desmosomes that are used with these anchoring junctions. The last type of animal junction are gap junctions. Gap junctions are channels between the cytoplasm of two neighboring cells and allow for materials to pass between the cytoplasm of those two cells. So here in this diagram, we see the three types of junctions. The tight junctions are going to be that very solid connection that prevents water from passing from one side of the tissue to the other. Anchoring junctions are the strongest of the junctions, and they have visible desmosomes when viewed under a microscope. And then gap junctions, in essence, it's similar to transport proteins we've looked at previously, but in this way, it's connecting the cytoplasm of two neighboring cells, and it's passing through two layers of cell membrane. Now for plant cells, they're just a little different. There's only one type of cell junction for plant cells, these are known as plasmodesmata. These are channels that bridge the two layers of cell walls between the cells along with their plasma membranes, in this way connecting the cytoplasm of the two neighboring cells. This allows plant cells to pass small molecules and water between the cells, in essence allowing those plant cells to communicate. So these are the connections between the neighboring cells. Now, how do distant cells communicate? 
they use chemical messages known as hormones. For this form of communication to work, some cells have to produce small proteins or molecules. These are the communication molecules. These are the hormones. Yet other cells, they have to have protein receptors that are specific for those communication molecules. These receptors, these hormone receptors, are going to be found in the receiving cell. Signaling molecules produce changes within that receiving cell. Hormones allow for long distance communication. The cells can be anywhere from centimeters to meters apart, depending on the type of organism we're talking about. Now, in plants, these hormones travel in the sap, whereas for animals, these hormones will travel in the blood. When talking about these communication molecules, the hormones can be hydrophobic or hydrophilic. The hydrophilic hormones have cell surface receptors, whereas the hydrophobic hormones have intracellular receptors. And this all goes back to the properties of the plasma membrane. Remember, the plasma membrane is permeable to hydrophobic molecules, but not to large molecules which have electrical charges like a hydrophilic hormone would be. So the hydrophobic hormone can pass right through the plasma membrane of the receiving cell to bind to a receptor inside of that receiving cell, whereas the hydrophilic hormone would not be able to pass through the plasma membrane, so instead binds to a receptor on the surface of the receiving cell. In this way, the chemistry of the hormone determines where its receptor will be found in the receiving cell. Because of the properties of the plasma membrane, the location of the receptors can be determined based on whether we know if we have a hydrophobic or hydrophilic hormone. The plasma membrane is permeable to hydrophobic hormones. but impermeable to hydrophilic ones. And in fact, in this way, the hydrophilic hormone will never actually enter the receiving cell. It will only ever bind to the surface of the target cell. An example of a hydrophobic hormone would be a steroid hormone. Steroid hormones are made out of lipids specifically those ring lipids like cholesterol. The steroid hormones diffuse into the receiving cell and bind to an internal receptor protein. Again, we use the term intracellular. To state that the receptor is inside of the target cell, and this will cause some sort of change in the actions of the receiving cell. In this diagram, we can sort of see that pathway of the steroid hormone entering the cytoplasm of the receiving cell, binding with that intracellular receptor. Together, that complex enters the nucleus of the receiving cell, and now a separate section of the DNA is activated, which will result in the production of a new or different protein, giving the cell some new behavior or some new action. This is the end to our introduction to the eukaryotic cell. In our next sections, we're going to talk about different chemical reactions within the cell and how the cell is able to control those, and also where the cell gets its energy from. See you in the next video.